Okay, so um, welcome everybody this evening. So um, I'm Danny McCoy, the uh, president of the society. Um, so welcome to the sixth ordinary meeting of the 174th session of the Statistical Society. Uh, so tonight or this evening, we have a paper on a high frequency model of the COVID-19 pandemic in Ireland and its trading partners during 2020. Uh, so the paper tonight is going to be delivered by our colleagues from the Department of Finance, Donald Smith and Luke Rettel, and their co-author on this paper, Han Sheng Xu from the Southwestern University uh, of China, uh, also acknowledged, but um, given the time difference in China, I don't think he would join the guys who are going to do the needful. Um, as ever, I'm going to um, ask the Honorary Secretary to get through the formalities of our meeting. So over to the Honorary Secretary, uh, Ronan. Thank, thank you very much, Danny. So uh, the, the main job I have to do is to read the minutes of the last ordinary meeting of the Society, which is, was the fifth meeting of the 174th session of the Society. So that took place at five o'clock on Thursday, the 29th of April, 2021, online due to the COVID-19 pandemic and associated restrictions on physical meetings uh, with assistance from Trinity Research in Social Sciences. The President, Danny McCoy, was in the chair for a symposium with the theme, International Trade and Investment Agreements Fit for Future Purpose. Papers were delivered by Chris Barton, the Director General of Trade Negotiations at the UK Department for International Trade, her Excellency Eilish Campbell, Canada's ambassador to the EU, and Dr. Martina Laws, research professor at the Economic and Social Research Institute here in Dublin. During the subsequent discussion, questions and contributions were made by Sean Barrett, Donald O'Brolcoin, Owen Flaherty, Ronan Lyons, Paul Walsh, and John Flanagan. Following the discussion and responses from the authors, the president thanked those who had contributed and brought the meeting to a close. That's great. Thanks, Ronan. So um, I'm going to hand over to Donal and to Luke now to take us through the paper. The vote of thanks will be from David Higgins of Carrick Hill. Um, so around quarter past five or so, or we'll hand over to David, then we'll open it up for Q&A and promise to have everybody done and dusted uh, before six o'clock. Uh, so Donal, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Uh, so can you, can everyone see that there? Uh, you can now, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to present the paper, uh, High Frequency Model of the COVID-19 Pandemic in Ireland and its Trading Partners during 2020. I'd like to thank the Society for, um, for inviting us to give the paper and also for the title. We had a much more clunky title, but on, uh, on Ronan's uh, uh, recommendation, it's a lot cleaner now. Um, and so I will be presenting, I'll go through the first half of the presentation and then Luke will take over. And as I said, because of the time difference, Hai Cheng won't, uh, won't participate. He also has a new child, so we can't, uh, we can't be keeping him up late. So a uh, brief outline then. So I'll talk through the introduction, uh, some of the literature in this field, because there's a number of different ways of uh, trying to model the pandemic. And then I'll look at more detail about the estimation and data that we use. And then, as I said, Luke will take us through the results and conclusions. So the, by way of introduction, I mean, we're, we're still in the situation, I suppose. Uh, and this paper, we combine ourselves to 2020. So by the end of 2020, on the data that we used, there had been 71.5 million cases of COVID-19 and 1.6 million fatalities. And due to the highly contagious nature of the disease, as we know, this has meant that the stringency of the containment measures have been unprecedented uh, and economic activity in some sectors has completely ceased and in others the labour market went from a situation of full employment say in late uh, 2019 to one in which unemployed, the unemployment level reached was the highest on record and different institutions within Ireland such as the central bank um, and ESRI give GDP estimated impacts back in kind of sort of March, April, May of minus seven to minus 10.5% of GDP. And one of, the, one of the features of this was, you know, it was a global pandemic. So in addition to the projected uh, impacts in Ireland, there would also be an impact from other countries to our trading partners. And this would weigh on demand and so economic activity in Ireland. And one of the most important variables that we, we would look at in the Irish economy, certainly in the Department of Finance would be how world demand uh, how world demand evolves given Ireland's a small open economy and one of the most globalized economies in the world. So what we had in, in mind when we were looking at the evolution of, of the pandemic 
from a kind of economics department, uh, the Department of Finance point of view is every year with the budget, we produce sensitivity analysis. And one of the main shocks, as I mentioned, that we would look at is, is what happens to world demand. And this sensitivity analysis, it frames the budget, it frames the, the work that uh, Department of Finance would bring to the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council for getting clearance on our numbers. Uh, and this table here is from the risk and sensitivity analysis in the budget. So from this, we kind of thought, well, it's important not just to track how the pandemic is going to evolve in Ireland, but also in our, in our key trading partners uh, globally. And one, uh, one estimate that was out there was that, and it was from the OECD, was a, a 10 point tightening of, I'm sure people are familiar with, the Oxford Stringency Index, which tries to create a, a metric for how tight these lockdown restrictions are. So they said a 10 point tightening of this stringency index would result in a one percentage point decline in quarterly GDP growth. So very important for us to try to track uh, how the pandemic was evolving. And then we had some just some summary measures. These are, uh, this is a, a graph that was adopted from one that was in the Financial Times. So you can see there was kind of a trade off early on in the pandemic between debts versus stringency of lockdown measures. And then, and this is another one that was prepared by the Department of Finance, where we look at uh, this sort of Oxford stringency index, as I just measured or just mentioned, and then the, uh, the fatalities and the sort of uh, dynamics of COVID-19 and the GDP fall. So then when we, um, when we went to, to look at this, uh, to look at this question, it's a, it was really a high frequency data processing and estimation question. And so with the rapid changes in the dynamics of the pandemic, the lockdown measures could change on a daily basis. And if we remember back to March, April, May, it was, you know, there was these big speeches on the television and it, it really did change very quickly. So we felt the need uh, for daily tracking across, not just in Ireland, but across a large number of countries. And this motivated the development of the model in our paper. And the to kind of topics that we deal with in economics and finance, say in the Department of Finance, we would be kind of at the forefront of dealing with these high frequency and big data modeling issues anyway. And I think, it, I think it's important to mention as well that this is a Department of Finance paper. And it was interesting for us that this was, um, you know, over 10 years after the financial crisis. And there had been a reform of the civil services regards the setting up of IGES and, and the economic stream. And so we found when we did go to do this paper, we had a lot of help from within the IGES network, you know, interacting with colleagues in the Department of Finance. We had a lot of support from our management in, in finance, John McCarthy and Brendan O'Connor to develop these techniques. And we had all the software that we needed to develop this as well. So I think that's just interesting to know what the kind of position we were in when we started to set up this project. Um, and we would say as well that initially, what we wanted to do was to set up uh, a cross-country uh, comparison of summary statistics. And, and now, I mean, when you, I suppose, go on even the Daily Mail website, you get those kind of stats. But when you think back to early March, April, May in 2020, this really wasn't available anywhere. And there's a nice line in a, in a paper in our literature review, which, which says that, you know, despite the considerable volume of media attention, a lot of this was placed on country league tables of cumulative COVID cases and fatalities. And these failed to make adjustments for population size, the starting point of the pandemic. For example, it started much earlier in Italy than it did in the United States. And, and, and we can kind of forget that now, but back at that time, uh, you know, every night on the BBC or RT, you would just see these very rough kind of statistics. So we just wanted to refine that. We wanted to update that every day and have this more kind of dynamic comparison over time and make, make some of these adjustments that we might think were important. And so then the modeling approach, when we looked at the literature, there are two broad approaches. So there's time series estimation, and that's the approach that we use in this paper. Uh, and we found that this was say complementary to these bigger SEIR models that I'm sure everyone is familiar with now where we calculate the R number uh, and it, it motivates uh, the analysis uh, that the government relies on uh, as regards lockdown restrictions. So a little bit of background on these models. So for me, uh, and it has been mentioned in the literature, they're, they're very similar to the big policy simulation tools in governments and central banks. So in the Department of Finance, we have the Cosmo model. And this is the model that produced the table that I mentioned earlier, this world demand shock. So different scenarios, you know, tax changes, uh, a slowdown in the UK to do with Brexit, all of these hypothetical situations run through these large models. So a large 
large, theoretically motivated, a large set of equations and cal calibrated parameters. And in this case, for these epidemiological models, key epidemiological variables. So they do these counterfactual policy scenario analysis, you know, what happens if there's a lockdown, easing of certain restrictions and other measures. And they can take in alternative assumptions on the number of contacts uh, individ of individuals and on the transmissibility of the disease. So if there's a new variant, what might happen? Uh, and for these types of models, similar to a lot of those big sort of macro simulation models, there's a huge amount of detail, uh, a big setup time, and a lot of data needed to run these, to run these uh, models for a particular country. So our approach, we would, see, we would have seen it as complementary because what we wanted to do was something a bit different. We wanted a flexible, high speed, high speed more simple model just to do this kind of cross-country comparison. Because what we done initially originally was set up the data bank uh, and had the summary statistics and then we thought well we can probably go one step further and we needed something flexible to fit this huge volume of data i think we had data for 186 countries uh, every single day in the data in the data bank at this time so in terms of um then our approach then so the economic econometric strategy was then to focus on modeling these empirically observed COVID-19 population infection curves. So the, the idea is just to fit a model to the observed data. And we can see up here, I'm going to try to use this annotate tool. This is the kind of idea that we had. So we remember back in the early stages of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about the steepness of the curve and, and flatten the curve policies. And so different econometric distributions uh, respond to different things so what we really didn't want uh, in terms of COVID was to be something like this a really rapid build-up of cases which could overwhelm the medical system what you wanted to be was more something flat like this and all of these distributions correspond to different estimated parameters of the econometric approach and the specific approach that we use was logistic models and these can be used to provide a simple representation of the evolution of the infection numbers, hospitalizations, and deaths from the pandemic, as I said, by fitting a curve to the available series. And the model is flexible enough to take it in at the initial exponential phase and then all the way through to the, to the kind of tapering off of the pandemic. And the benefit of this is it's you know very simple, very flexible. As I said, we had a huge amount of data updated every single day. Uh, and we just wanted to try to capture what was going on and to try to capture some of the underlying trends that you don't see with the summary statistics. And we were encouraged by the fact that early work on this uh, had been done using these types of models and have, they found a high degree of accuracy uh, in predicting the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic in Wuhan. Uh, and then the data has also been applied to other regions within China. And when we were even starting this, it had been applied to Costa Rica, to Italy, to Spain and the US. And again, they had a, had a pretty high degree of accuracy of fit in each, in each case. So uh, on from the data and model. Oh, I don't know, can I remove my annotation there? Oh, we'll, we'll stick with it. Um, so the, for the data then, uh, so we used the European Centre for Disease Controls, um, ECDC data. So we had daily data on cases and fatalities covering 184 countries and beginning on the 31st of December 2019. Uh, we selected the fatalities data because there was considerable cross-country variation in testing and coverage, uh, much more volatile than what happened with fatalities. However, there is issues with the fatalities data, which I should mention. So there's a, there was a very good paper by the Royal Society of Medicine that went through a lot of these issues and, and some of the things that, that should be borne in mind is that WHO guidance on what exactly is a COVID-19 debt de was not introduced until April 2020, which was well into the first wave of the pandemic. And then to take the example of the UK, uh, the Department of Health and the National Health Service counted a fatality if there was a positive test whereas the Office for National Statistics included a fatality if COVID-19 was mentioned anywhere on the death certificate. Uh, and then there was also, uh, in, in Russia, I think the practice was, it was, it was not a COVID-19 death unless it was confirmed by an autopsy. So it had to be an autopsy. And when they did the autopsy, they found, well, was it really COVID, was it not? So just to bear in mind, a bit more accurate than, than cases, but there would be issues there as well. 
And also a final issue at the beginning of the pandemic, there was no standard method for diagnosing uh, COVID-19. So this had, this had yet, to be, uh, yet to be established. Um, I've managed to get rid of that line there. So then moving on. So the model then, um, so looking at the dynamics of, of fatalities across countries, we use a stochastic difference equation in logistic form. And the equation is given here and where FT is the cumulative number of fatalities at time T, um, B are the parameters, as I said, capture different features of the, of the curve and time is given by T. Uh, for estimation of the model, we discretize it and an error term is, addle, is added. Uh, and estimated is in differences given the well-known issues of spurious results on levels time series data. And in the literature as well, uh, and in our paper, people do use alternative distributions. So beta and gamma distributions are quite, uh, quite common and are used as a forecasting, generally in forecasting papers when they want to look at uh, how many fatalities will there be. And the reason for this we can see up here uh, on the top right, I'll try this, I'll try this annotate thing again. So with, with the logistic distribution, one of the things it's symmetric, so it goes up and down at the same rate. And what people started to notice was that as the, as the pandemic evolved, there was this pronounced skew. So it, the pandemic came down a lot slower than what it went up. So with a symmetric distribution, you're losing a lot of the, a lot of the numbers. So you'll underestimate the total number of fatalities. So this is why people started switching to these beta and gamma distributions. And this was an interesting evolution in the literature as well, because what, what was funny enough about it was that in China, these symmetric distributions fit really well what happened in terms of COVID. It was only when COVID hit Europe that these, these kind of pronounced skews start to happen on the distribution. Um, and I said, the benefit of this is, you know, we, it's, it's more in terms of calculating total fatalities. But for us and what we were doing, we went with a logistic model and Luke will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and, they, and then just in terms of the mathematical function, uh, so the first line is logistic, uh, beta and gamma, uh, and where the right-hand side of the equation would represent these bell-shaped or sort of skewed distributions. Uh, the point on beta and gamma distributions is to have additional parameters, and these additional parameters are what allow them to capture the slightly more complex uh, uh, shape of the distribution. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, not apparent that this was needed until kind of well into the, into the European pandemic in the first wave. And interesting to note that these beta and gamma models, they do indeed outperform the logistic model in terms of the out of sample forecasting of the total number of fatalities. Um, and Luke will show some examples of this. The logistic model is, however, because it doesn't have as many parameters, it was a little bit more flexible in providing these high frequency estimates of a specific property of the COVID-19 fatalities data. Because from an economic point of view, what was interesting for us is how steep uh, is the curve in these countries, because a steeper curve implies more pressure on the medical system, implies lockdown measures, and that leads to this economic hitch, which is what we were really interested in. Uh, so, and as I said, these kind of flattened or curve policies would, uh, would follow on from that. And, oh yeah, so at this point I, uh, I hand over to Luke and he'll take us through the results and conclusions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, hopefully, yeah. And just a reminder, Luke, to unmute as well. Thank you. So, yeah, you might let me know. Can you see the screen okay? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, yeah. Thanks. Great. So, yeah, just to start off and kind of paint a picture of what we're talking about when we're on about the, the curves and waves, and yeah, just to give you an overview and a reminder of uh, this is just a COVID instance in Ireland and other European countries for 2020. So as you can see clearly there's, there's two waves, uh, the first wave being beginning late February up until basically the end of spring. And then the second wave kind of kicking off into the start of September, right through the end of 2020. 
Um, and yet you can see there's obviously slight like differences between the two ways, partly due to differences in testing, testing regimes and the likes. So that's just the uh, COVID cases. A uh, very similar story. Oops, let's see if my space bar is jammed. Um, yeah, similar enough story on fatalities. Um, where there's two clear ways around the same, same period of time. Um, the difference here, uh, you can see for on that the, the second wave was actually not quite as severe, uh, that partly being due to, to the cases being concentrated amongst uh, a young, the, the younger population who had tended to have a uh, lower fatality right there, but there still seems to be there's still clearly two two second waves, and we define second wave in our analysis as from the very first week of September. The reason for this is this that was the first week where we saw consecutive uh, weekly increase in fatalities. Um, so that's kind of that, and so yeah, so Donald's kind of already touched upon the fact we produced summary statistics initially. Um, this was kind of similar to the Tordy's Lee tables that you were seeing in, in a lot of the media. Um, and that's kind of how we began. We just kind of produced these on a daily basis, comparing Ireland to some of what we considered the, the main trading partners. And yes, yeah, so we update these for our own sake, but also during the peak of the crisis, we provided these to the Department of Health as well as IMAG on a daily basis. Then we want to kind of go beyond that. So that's where we start to kind of produce this, um, these estimates using the logistic functions Donna mentions to, to get an idea of how, exact, how exactly, um, how steep or flat, steepness or flatness of these curves and uh, to get an idea of when exactly this, 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 these curves will flatten. Um, and this kind of gives us an actual measure we could focus on and estimate on a daily basis to kind of give us an idea of when, when uh, Ireland, as well as the other trading partners, might uh, be able to get out of lockdown. Um, and as I said, yeah, we were able to track this daily. Um, but obviously, yeah, the, uh, the economic implications of this. Um, so just to kind of show you, go back again to cases. Um, so this is just the cases for the first wave, just up until the end, the middle of June, basically. But uh, clearly, when we were carrying out these summary statistics, you can see, just looking at total cases, that. Uh, that there was always going to be a maximum point even early on in, 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 in the crisis. Um, what we were interested in is trying to work out when exactly this, this maximum point would occur, uh, or this turn point or inflection point, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, what we want to know is when we'd start seeing, when we'd reach this and then start to see a decline in cases um, and then a possible exit out of lockdown measures. So that's where we we, uh, we applied the models that, that uh, Donald has kind of given an overview of. Um, so yeah, just to go back to the summary statistics that we mentioned, this is the kind of thing we were initially kind of sending around to Department of Health and IMAG. Um, just, uh, however, as Donald said, a lot, initially a lot of these would just be in total fatalities and there was no, say, adjustments for um, the size of the population in each country, uh, as well as the different starting points. So that's kind of the, that was our starting point where a lot of this, with uh, most of these charts and the works, we, the work we were circulating. So this is just um, yeah, Ireland and some of the main train partners we were considering. And you can see the differences in fatalities as a shared population. Um, and then you can see the likes of the US where it was, it was a lot slower to kick off over there. However, when it did start to pick up, it's fairly rapid and then they began to start to overtaking some of the other countries. And this is the kind of thing we were looking at on a, on a daily basis, to try and get uh, an idea of how, how we were doing over here in comparison to other countries, as well as an idea of how how exactly uh, these countries were performing. Um, but yeah, we were trying to see exactly when when these curves would start flattening out as well, as we said. However, just from, from eyeball and these kind of charts, you could only get kind of so much. And that's how we ended up proceeding with the, the kind of model procedure to get an estimate of this flatness using the, the kind of beta coefficients that Don mentioned. Um, so that's where we apply this uh, logistic function Don described. And I've just picked out four countries here um, and the estimates of the, so that's so the line here is the fatalities curve similar to the previous slide and then the bars is the kind of the estimates of these fatalities that we obtained from the logistic function and as you can see for four countries there that we picked out um, the estimates were there was a very close fit between the, the estimates and the actual data and the reason we picked these four countries um, to show you, it. so China obviously had had first cases and fatalities, um, and so they were a fairly late stage of pandemic when we produced this chart. 
um, in comparison to, to Italy and Spain, who had some of the more severe, um, who hit more a lot more severely by uh, in, in Europe anyway, compared to some of the other countries. Um, and so, yeah, so kind of, and obviously we were, had our main folks in Ireland as well. But you can see, despite these uh, different countries being at different stages, the logistic function fit fairly well. So just to demonstrate with a lot more flexible than some of, some of the other kind of model specifications to discuss were. Um, and then we go on to the this uh, steepness or flatness parameter, and this is again just kind of the this is where our folks end up being on to get an idea of when exactly um, or how, how each country was doing in terms of uh, relative flatness or steepness, uh, as opposed to just focusing on them summary statistics that we were looking at initially. Um, and you can see here we just pick out a few countries, um, and sorry, so this is this steepness parameter. So a higher value here would suggest a steeper curve. Um, and yeah, so an increase in fatality is at a lot higher a rate. Um, and you can see here, say Korea, for example, had a very low parameter throughout the, throughout the early stages of the pandemic. And, and they, they managed to actually avoid severe lockdown measures throughout the first wave. Um, this is in comparison to say the UK and US who had pretty high values there. Um, and eventually had to bring in pretty severe lockdown restrictions. Um, whereas Ireland is the green bar, and that was a lot closer to uh, to, to Austria. We saw throughout, uh, very close to Austria and Denmark, who actually ended up being two of the countries who were uh, able to uh, end their lockdown restrictions in the first wave. Or, um, so we kind of, throughout the pandemic, when we were tracking this, we saw that as a kind of a, a positive there. Um, so that's yeah so that's kind of just describing some stuff we said so we could see throughout that some countries were progressively declining in this steepness parameter while other, others such as the uk and us were remaining high um the orange flatness parameter was declining throughout and we could see this even though the actual numbers uh, on a daily basis were increasing exponentially or appear to be to just underline the importance of using a, a model to, to look beyond this kind of raw data uh, in the paper that's being published, we we also show we also provide the estimates for the turning points of when this uh, when we'd reached the peak of these uh, fatalities curves. So we have, for example, an example in the first wave we estimated to be the last week of May in the UK, the last week of April. And we went back and we would when we went back and compared to what we actually saw, we were within a week or two for, for most countries there. And then Donald discussed that there's other different uh, specifications you could apply. So ju we just, we actually, uh, as a robustness check, we apply these to a number of countries. So I've just shown it for Ireland here. Um, so you can see your logistic gamma and beta uh, specifications. And you can see it's been, it's, it's kind of harder to see it for the logistic function, but it's declining for all three in the, the first wave of the pandemic. Um, slightly higher, it's a higher value for the gamma and beta uh, models, but this is the case in when we for all countries. Um, but you can also see that the gamma and beta distribution were a lot more models were a lot more volatile. Um, it, so again, this is the reason we kind of stuck with the logistic uh, model going forward. Um, partly for, as I showed, the fact it's able to you can fit it to a number of countries uh, quite easily, despite the differences in where they are in the pandemic. But also just the fact it was a lot more stable model. So then just moving on to the, the second wave, this is, as I mentioned, this is just for estimated from the 1st of September up until the end of 2020. And this is again, just a flatness parameter, um, just for a few different countries. Um, and again, you could see, say for example, uh, uh, the UK um, had, and UK and Spain had very high uh, flatness parameters there, which would suggest that they were eventually going to have to end up in, in some sort of lockdown or introducing some sort of lockdown measures. Whereas the likes of Sweden had seen a very uh, low level for this parameter. And indeed, and of course, they managed to avoid any introducing any severe lockdown restrictions throughout. Um, so it just again showed the value there. Um, we could see this for, for, for a lot of the main trading partners that, that this uh, parameter was remaining quite high. So kind of just to, to bring it all together. So as I said at the start, the, uh, the pandemic was spreading rapidly around the globe and causing considerable challenges for policymakers and elsewhere, uh, including those looking at um, 
the economic impact and kind of key determinant of the economic impact was always going to be tracking the after of the pandemic. Um, and to do this, obviously, the a wide range of model approaches from the medical literature, such as the SEIR models that were discussed. Um, but what we did is we reapplied some of the techniques and modeling methodologies that we were already applying and, and using on a daily basis to look at economic variables. And we, we were able to rework and reapply these to, to look at the cases and fatality data that the, the ECDC were provided for uh, a number of different countries. And we were able to initially, as we said, uh, just turn these into summary statistics and provide some sort of add to the evidence base that was available to Department of Health. We we're also then able to come up with our own kind of estimate um, as well as and provide this to them as well. And this was able to provide us with some sort of early indication of the, the changing situation in Ireland, as well as another of main trading partners, and give us some sort of idea of uh, how long these lockdowns might last and their economic impact. So as I showed, the model showed at the time in the first wave uh, that there would that there was a flattening over in the curve in Ireland compared to other countries. And we could see this even though the number of fatalities was still, still increasing. We also show in the paper then that if you kind of reapplied or taken the the curve for Spain and reapplied it to Ireland, that we would have hit uh, we would have hit a thousand fatalities about two or three weeks earlier than we actually did. And we when we applied this to the second wave, we were able to see that this this wave would had have a lot less of a skewed distribution. Where I'll kind of discuss what the skewed distributions are. So. Um, yeah, we were seeing a lot less of skew distribution in the first wave, but we'd still seen at the same time this lockdown, the lockdown measures were going to persist into 2020 in a number of other countries in Europe. And then just to kind of conclude with a few caveats already kind of touched upon a few, there's obviously the differences in terms of the definitions of fatalities across countries, as well as within countries such as the UK. But there's also a number of other different things to consider, such as uh, age profiles in different countries, which we try to kind of take account for initially by looking at some statistics in terms of um, kind of controlling as a share of the, the population over 65. But again, that's not, not a, a kind of perfect control, as well as the different time of the virus at this time of the season it hits as well, as well as just the ability of so, so, uh, countries to respond or to have a medical response and the speed at which they could do so. Um, so that's uh, kind of all. And yeah, just uh, again, just to thank, thank everyone. Thanks for having us present and Thanks for the feedback and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Luke, and thank you, Donald. Uh, hi, Sheng has joined us as well. Thank you for joining us this evening. I know it's near midnight and uh, I believe congratulations are in order as well. We won't be impressed if it was your kid that got you up to come to this seminar, but uh, we will, we will be, we're delighted to see you and thank you uh, for joining us. Um, our vote of thanks tonight is going to be by David Higgins. David has been doing great work. David of Carrie Kill uh, was always very timely uh, on tracking uh, what the numbers were going on here in Ireland. So no better uh, discussant or proposer of the vote of thanks. So David, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thanks, Danny. Uh, and hello to everyone. Um, thank you to Ron for asking me to, to do this. It's a privilege to, to do this. It's the first time I've ever done a discussant. So uh, let's see how I get on. Um, so uh, let me see, has that begun to share yes. now? Yeah, it's, it's up there now. Thanks, David. And is that? Yeah, we're seeing just the, you know, the, the other one. The yeah. Screen, yeah, yeah, I just need to flip those. So give me two seconds. In display settings, you might be able to. Yeah, uh, let me see. This. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. So, um, oh, thanks. So, uh, first, just to give a quick background of myself, um, I, 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 I am known for, for putting those numbers up on, on Twitter. That's what I say I do by night. But uh, by day, uh, I work here in Carrickill as an analyst uh, looking at a um, variety of different things. But one of the reports that we put out is a report called The Signal, and it tracks real time indicators for the pandemic uh, globally. So, uh, it's great that this paper is about Ireland's trading partners. It's great. It's about global countries. Uh, it's something that I track quite quite frequently. And what I'm going to do in my response here is, is trying to give a flavour of some of that to, to complement the work that, uh, that, that you guys have, have done. 
So um, I'm going to begin by just giving my kind of highlights from the, the paper, the stuff that stood out for me. Uh, I'm going to then talk through those um, real time indicators that I mentioned, and then I'll just talk about some of the changes that have happened since and how that impacts the paper. And then I'll uh, just ask some questions at the end and hand back to, to you guys to get the Q&A going. So um, the highlights for me, I mean, firstly, it's a highly relevant goal that you guys have chosen to, to, to look after, to assess Ireland, not just Ireland, but also trading partners. Uh, and it's so important given the volume of trade that, that we do in Ireland. I think our exports alone are equivalent to over 100% of our, our GDP. So uh, to, to have a view, have a, a read on what's happening in the other countries is, 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 is so relevant. Uh, what really stood out to me uh, was that the model was able to indicate that a second wave was what was coming in Europe. And, and that's something that, again, feeds into that, that high relevance for, for the work that you've done. Um, what stood out as well is that, uh, I've quoted here, that it provided a flexible model that could accurately capture the shape of the virus at all stages and profiles. And you show that in the middle of the report when it shows the fitted uh, values uh, from the model. Um, I, I think it goes to show that actually the, the virus you know, behaves, it, it doesn't matter which country, um, you know, it hits, it, it behaves in, in, in a relatively similar way. I mean, I remember when the virus first came to Ireland, one of the charts I was putting out was, was showing that Ireland was only two weeks behind Italy on the curve. And that was a scary thing to put out for people, uh, but I believed it was true. And it, 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 it was bearing fruit for the weeks and weeks afterwards, where we really were just were following it up the curve until we went to lockdown. And then obviously the curve, we came down on the other side. Um, the, the model then was able to predict the, the point of inflection. And I think that idea of inflection points is, is, is so important uh, when you're trying to, to, to see where the turn has happened. Uh, with fatalities, it, it, it's definitely something that makes it certain that you're coming down the other end of the curve. Um, and then the last point, just that it adds insight into the duration of, of lockdown measures. Uh, again, I mean, we, we know that better than anyone else in Europe now, having been five months now in an incredibly deep, uh, deep lockdown. So what I'm going to go to then is just um, some of these real-time indicators that I that I mentioned um, uh, that, that I've been working on. And I think that that complement uh, your work quite well. Uh, but but first, actually, just to uh, I know this says vote of thanks, so I thought I'd try and give give some thanks uh, during this. Uh, is just to look at the the indicators that the department has been putting out because the report that you guys put out is incredibly insightful, uh, and I'm jealous that Revolut uh, give you um, payments data because it's something that uh, we follow quite closely in Caracal. We cover some payments companies and knowing. Um, whether people are spending their money on, on healthcare, on transport, on travel, on shopping, all of that is really, really insightful data, uh, particularly on the right there, the mix of physical online, that should now be jumping up for physical with the reopening of, of retail now in Ireland. Um, so it'll be uh, positive to see that, that, see that happening. So the signal, as I mentioned, is a report that 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 that, that I work on, which looks uh, looks at a monthly set of data. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the the the, the points on that and, and how they kind of relate to the, to the work that, that that you have done. The first one here is 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 a measure of um, what we call peak new cases. Um, so what this measures is that uh, it it compares the current level of cases to whatever the maximum cases in the past has been. So um, in in Ireland's second wave, we hit a new peak of 100, but then the third wave, we went even, even higher. Uh, what, the, what this shows here now is that most countries uh, in Europe and around the US uh, are below peak values versus their, their previous peaks. And the previous peaks were typically around November, uh, December. But what I think is, is relevant here is, is you know, regarding things like, like lockdown, um, uh, you said your model you know, kind of gives an indication as whether lockdown is, is coming. The, the one thing that I think look, what we do when we look at this is where we actually say, well, because we're not yet at a new peak, if we're rising up uh, to 70, 80, 90 on these values, it's only really when we get to near 100 on this measure that it indicates to us that a lockdown is coming. Because if, if, if countries have already been through um, a wave and they've kind of bore with it, uh, I think we're learning that there's a certain sense of, you know, we've been through this before, therefore we can bear it. That kind of perspective seems to be a bit pervasive in, in how some countries think about it. Um, so I think this this peak value allows us to, to to get a handle on that from 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 our point of view. 
stringency you, you mentioned that we we what we've done here is we actually rank the, the stringency by world gdp um so it's kind of analogous to what you do when you think of ireland's trading partners we're trying to do it about a, a kind of global perspective um uh, as we can see there china is first but then the u.s states the u.s alone is is, is half is a quarter of the world's gdp but california uh, texas are actually split up by individual states there and it shows a real mixed picture but what we have here as well is the two-week change uh, and like it shows us as of recently, lockdown stringency is largely uh, largely uh, easing across the world, which is uh, uh, which is great. Um, what we've also done, um, and I think this is where I wanted to make a, a kind of a suggestion for, for for the research that you guys do, is that we we've weighted this by but by GDP. So this is the uh, the world, Asia, Europe, and North America, the lockdown stringency, and it's weighted by the GDP of those countries. So within Europe, it's taking all the European countries, weighting it by their each of their GDPs. So you know, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain will be high on the ranking, Ireland will be less, and allows us to see how the whole continent is moving from a lockdown perspective. And that's important for us when we think of investing. But you know, what, what could be useful for, for Ireland to do is, is to, to weighted by our trading partners. So UK and US would be would be pretty high in the weighting and other countries um, less so. And that could give um, a kind of weighted lockdown stringency measure. And I'll show later we do it with Google Mobility as, as, as well. Um, just to say, so I've just put the stringency versus the Google Mobility here. Um, I, I, I kind of describe stringency is, is the rules and Google Mobility is whether people are following the rules or not. And um, I think we've learned a bit of that in Ireland recently with Neffet pointing out that, you know, journeys to workplaces have been rising amid an unchanged lockdown stringency. And I think there's been a bit of a decoupling in Ireland between the two in, in the recent past. And certainly I'm a little bit skeptical of the stringency uh, measure because when you, when you look at the before Christmas reopening, uh, it was a very small drop in the stringency level. But as we know, it led to a very large increase in mobility and was uh, associated with a huge peak in, in cases. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd love to know whether that relationship that, that, that you showed, Donald, between uh, GDP and stringency is, is holding now into Q1 this year because uh, I know most European countries have posted very positive Q1 uh, GDP numbers amid um, a, a, large, a largely deep lockdown equivalent to, to, to the depths of the, the first lockdown. Um, so it seems that that relationship seems to be de de decoupling a bit. Um, uh, Ronan had a question for me just to, to address during this is, uh, is, is Ireland really the most stringent uh, lockdown in, in Europe? And um, as of a couple of days ago, Germany has just pipped us slightly, but we spent most of the past couple of months in the highest, at least of the peer countries I picked here, which is the, the large trading partners in Europe and the US. Uh, and then on the right, it shows the retail and recreational mobility, uh, where Ireland was one of the lowest at the depths of the lockdown. And again, that's kind of the inverse, you know, if stringency is high, the uh, activity tends to be tends to be low. Uh, this is the uh, Google Mobility again, um, or it's the Google Mobility, but again, it's weighted. So weighted by GDP, um, you can see there it's um, it's actually two things. It's on the left, it's retail and recreation, and on the right, it's journeys to workplaces. And you'd see a mix of America, Europe, and UK, which are kind of three uh, markets that we would look at for, for, for financial, financial sector stuff. And what we've done here is um, just to give you know insight into how this real time data is so useful for uh, for our work is is looking at individual companies. So if you take the bottom left company, uh, Unibail, they're a, they're a REIT, they're a shopping center um, real estate company. And if you want to track uh, you know people going to shopping centers, well, this Google mobility metric of retail recreational activity is um, incredibly useful for us. So we can look at London, Paris, New York, California, where they have lots of shopping centers, and we can get a feel for whether people are actually going back to them. Um, and then, of course, Ireland's equivalent for that is looking at the recovery and economic activity, looking at people going back to, to bars, restaurants, where they reopen, and hopefully we'll see a, you know, a, a, a trend back towards zero again, back to the, the, the old levels. Um, just on the real time data, I wanted to just, um, you know, just talk about this with, with everyone here, just that, um, you know, the, this, this whole pandemic has been great for getting all of this real time data available to people, even just getting cases and deaths every day, but furthermore, the economic stuff uh, and stringency and Google mobility are, are two public ones, which I, uh, I, I list here, but, you know, we're beginning to see that private data, which is kind of 
semi-public, as I show here with this Irish Times article, is proving to be really, really insightful. Uh, six out of 10 people staying within 10 kilometers of their home by tracking mobile phone data. And I kind of, I, 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 that tracks movement, but it doesn't really track social interaction. And what I, I, I think will hopefully happen in the coming, uh, maybe if we have a future with Abbeck, obviously we don't want one, but that will have an even better measure for what I call social interaction. Because when people are going and their mobile phone tracks them, it doesn't prove that they've actually interacted with each other. If you can prove that someone has spent 10, 15 minutes indoors with someone based on their mobile phone data, that is kind of holy grail from a public health point of view to actually understand if a new wave is coming. And if you have that kind of data, then you will probably get the best possible leading indicator for uh, lockdowns and for how our trading partners will go because their social interactions are up, therefore their cases will be up, therefore hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I just wanted to kind of discuss that here, just raise it as a, as a thing, because I think uh, I think we've, we've crossed the Rubicon and getting all of this kind of real-time data, daily data. Like I never followed daily data before this pandemic, now I do. And, you know, I think it's going to change how we think about economies and how we think about, you know, but then there's privacy issues too and all that too. So there's a lot to unpack there, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move on. So I just want to note then finally, some of the changes since, and I'll just leave some questions in to, to start the, the Q&A. So um, in the paper, it said that the settings, that the, it mentioned settings with limited testing capacity. And I'd, I'd love to just ask, um, you know, do you think that that's changed now? I, I think we don't really have settings like that anymore. Most countries now have very good testing capacity in place. Even Ireland's uh, third wave was able to withhand, with was able to withstand the pressure from from testing just about it was very pat it was there's some days where there were backlogs and it problems but largely the the ability to get swabs done was 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 really well done and you know it's rapid testing in other countries etc um so would cases be a better metric um vaccinations is obviously a change since the paper and i wanted to raise hospital numbers because i i'm i'm kind of conscious that the vaccination uh, is now going to make cases a less relevant number and I know I'm contradicting my first point here but the, the idea being that you know we had a thousand cases and it, it tended to clog up hospitals if we have 10,000 cases mm -hmm. in future it probably won't clog up the hospitals because of the the vaccination program which which may still allow people to get infected people who you know the vaccines might might breach uh, the, the infection might breach, breach the vaccines but it may not clog up the hospitals because the, the immune system is able to fight the virus. So hospital data is now produced by the ECDC uh, across Europe, at least. That might be a measure which is more relevant in future for looming lockdown because if hospitals fill up, then we're going to have to have some restrictions again. I think that might be the post-vaccination um, way of thinking about it. Uh, and then just to, just to note um, that the paper talks about a fall in GDP of seven to ten percent, and thankfully there was no recession at all in Ireland last year. So uh, I just wanted to, to 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 note that it goes to show that uh, um, a lot can change in, in a short space of time. Um, and um, but thankfully, thankfully for the for the better in that case. Um, so I suppose related to some of those changes, just you know, how how would you model it today? Um, is is what I'd be interested to to, to know. Uh, would you use cases? Would you um, stick with deaths? Um, how do you think about the OR value? Because I've always thought about a looming lockdown as being a kind of an OR above one situation, uh, not irrespective of whether cases are high or low. That really, the governments and authorities don't want us don't want to have or above one for long because they know where it leads so even if it's a low level of cases and it's increasing it's still something that governments want to stop by by imposing re restrictions and then um and then lastly look um it said in the paper that the, the the work is adding to the real-time evidence and i've talked about the 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 revolut and the other data that that, that the department puts puts out um i i just love to know is are there other real-time indicators that you have been using that maybe you don't publish, that are ones that um, have been really insightful uh, for you in all the work that you do. And um, how have the relevance of these indicators changed? Because as I said, with vaccinations now, cases are, are a lot le less relevant. Uh, I think stringency for me is, is becoming a bit less relevant because of how uh, people are less you know, compliant with restrictions now. So mobility is a bit more important for me. Um, so I'd love to get your, your, your takes on that. So um, to, to end my thanks, I'm going to say thanks uh, to you for the paper. It was very insightful and I'm looking forward to the Q&A and hearing, hearing more about it all. So thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, David. Uh, appreciate that. So um, 
in, in the usual way for those who um, are attendees, if you, if you want to ask a question, put up the hand, or if that's not working for you, just come on and signal and Maeve will, um, will try and release you uh, onto the screen to ask the question. So I might hand over, first of all, though, to Donal, Luke and Hai Sheng, just to maybe react to some of the questions posed by David. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the point about how we would measure it now is um, is very relevant. Because is very relevant. I mean, at the end of the paper, I think we had a line uh, where we said um, uh, kind of coming to the point about the interaction of vaccines. Uh, we said mutations of the virus would result in um, could result in multiple reinfection, and would give us a kind of a stochastic equilibrium. And we'd need another modeling approach. So if you can imagine if you had one variant of the virus and it had a, a bell-shaped curve, but another variant comes in, it's, it'll change the profile quite considerably. So what would have what would have been interesting, I think what, what's been mentioned in some papers is to is to estimate the curves uh, based on you know tests of different variants at different points in time, and that would that would retain that that uh, that profile. Um, on the on the real time uh, indicators and the, and the adding additional evidence. It is an interesting point because when we started this off, we didn't really deal with uh, daily data either. Uh, and so we ended up going around looking at all these different sources. And I think at one point we were looking for seismic data because it was this idea that you could measure the, uh, the seismology parts of iron, could measure the vibrations in the ground. And that was an indicator of more traffic and more activity. Uh, but Luke has done a lot more work than me on the uh, real time indicators and developing them. So I might hand over to you, Luke, if you want to uh, Ted, give us an idea of how it's developed. Yeah, so no, we kind of started off with uh, just looking at the mobility data or anything that we could find that was publicly available to us. Um, and just the way it kind of transpired is uh, we kind of put out an initial report on what we could find uh, at a few different sources. And uh, we ended up, there was a lot of uh, kind of, a lot of companies are trying to approach us that they, they actually had today at hand. So, uh, that's um, so you know yeah that's how we ended up with the likes of the Revolut data and then we've ended up with say LinkedIn data and now there's Indeed data as well so that kind of gives us an idea of what's going on in the labour market on a real time basis and I think they've been in some of the more recent reports um, yeah and then and I don't so I think everything that's in them chart packs we put on on a monthly basis is what we use the only additional one that's there is uh, there is some uh, academic who's or academic paper or some website that does actually have a cross-country uh, our, our estimation of the R rate, which we find quite useful to look at just as for Ireland as, as well as other countries. So that's something that if we were to redo, we'd probably consider in the paper maybe. Um, and yeah, I agree with you as well in terms of um, possibly being having less need to focus on uh, say cases and the stringency rate going forward. Um, and yeah, we, we've seen that there is the, the ICU uh, daily data um, and hospitalizations daily data that's now available and that's probably something we'd if we were to redo it we'd probably focus on that instead instead of the, the fatalities date which has such a lag um so yeah that, um that's that's probably what we would read uh, do differently um i think at the moment the icu data isn't it's not available for too many countries it's only a small sampling but yeah uh, going forward it's something something we'll uh, keep an eye out for Good. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Does anybody want to come on to ask a question? If you want to unmute. On the issue that David raised about the GDP, um, you know, so you, those were forecasts, obviously, at the time. Um, does that have any implications on the forecasting for the model? You know, the, the, the forecasts of GDP um, in terms of trying to find out what stringency measures may be coming, trying to bring in the economic data in there as well, that the kind of now casting of GDP numbers or whatever, could you see that being part of predictions of what would be required in terms of lockdowns in the future? I'm just wondering, in in the kind of the feedback loop from the, the GDP forecast of the Comintra model. Oh, 
Well, I might. Uh, I'll let. I'll let. Luke, I was going to say I'll, I'll hand to Luke because he just had a, a paper out on uh, Nowcasting a couple of a couple of months ago. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll defer on this. Yeah. No. This the so this work was kind of more of a compliment to uh to some of the the other high frequency uh, indicates we were tracking. Um, but also we have the now cost that we were kind of carrying out on a, on a weekly basis, which are using, they'd be using, say, uh, a large, maybe 70 or 80 economic variables that we'd be picking out. Um, I think it's a paper we probably put out about a year ago. So that's actually, it's the now cost models of connectivity that they were the actual models we were kind of reworking and reapplying to this uh, COVID fatalities work. Um, so, so um so yeah, so that's something we were actually keeping track of at the same time, looking at how the kind of state now costs are in of um, of domestic measures of, of GDP, such as modified domestic demand. So um, so yeah, I think that might answer that. Yeah, maybe on the topic that David raised, where you're weighting by GDP, I guess one of the other phenomenon we've observed in Ireland on the controversy of what GDP is measuring, the intangibles, the kind of Another description I've, I've heard of that is a disembodiment um, uh, of activity. And so, you know, on that idea of disembodiment, um, would you, you know, if, if you're looking for a human centric metric, uh, would take into account of how significant the, the, the intangible aspect of an economy is, as opposed to, you know, another way of a reverse way of saying this, how much contact activity, the experience economy, as we would describe it, in terms of those things that are related to congregated um, tourism, uh, hospitality, how big a weight that has in your in your economy, how, how much that would perhaps justify the stringency or lockdown measures. You know, one of the things you probably didn't see that a priori in the Italian, Spanish, versus the Nordics as to how much more congregated economic activity form part of their economies. It may have explained some of the, some of the uh, outcomes from congregation or how societies actually perform. It's a convoluted way of saying GDP is complicated clearly, but would disembodiment of GDP and intangible be a way to, to look at the now casting into those serum models that you have? Uh, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, there is work um, out there by, well, by the OECD where I am now, which looks at the sector level impacts. And that's a way because, yeah, I mean, the, how to what degree different sectors can telework, to what degree different sectors are impacted by these things. And, and we've, we've seen that in Ireland where pharma and, and ICT, which kind of drive GDP has been you know, largely unaffected or, or even positively affected by this. So now there is work out there using um, the sort of CG approach uh, to take this sectoral heterogeneity into account, uh, which does give you a picture because it is it is uh, certainly a shock that has hit different things to, to vastly different different degrees. Not seeing any other questions, Ronan. I might ask. A part of the way the paper is written is about the the, the methodology and, and, and applying the methodology in, in, a, in a setting that is, is at least novel from a uh, a public administration point of view. And, and I'm wondering, uh, David mentioned, you know, hopefully we won't have another pandemic anytime soon, so you won't have to reapply this model in a new in, 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 to a new uh, pandemic. But are there other types of say maybe administrative data that you think this method may be um, usable on say like if, you, if you've got high frequency data on uh, employment uh, entry into employment or exit from employment or changing jobs you know I'm, I'm trying to think of other kinds of data where you'd have you know a lot of things happening maybe not as 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 uh, obviously in in waves um, but uh, are there other settings maybe healthcare would be would be one as well where you, you you might have it not with a disease but with with other things that are more seasonal in nature i'm just wondering have you thought about how you might take this method and, and use it in other settings within public administration uh oh, sorry yeah i mean one of the one of the things that uh this method is originally used for is um uh, pricing assets in finance 
And so we did think it would be it would be pretty nice to have the meta developed if we had another financial crisis and we wanted to look at some of the kind of complicated things on bond financing. At least we would have the kind of software and some of the methods there to look at some particular particular aspects of that. So I know for for sure when we were when we were developing when we were developing it initially, uh, it was very much to fit. Um, it was based on Department of Finance data and and some of those. Uh, ways of putting together summary statistics really quickly uh, but the methodology yeah, it's, it's a really nice uh, general technology to, um, that we could use in, in the future uh, if we had another financial crisis which we don't want but... Certainly not. yeah I might just add to that because uh, Ronan you asked about you know possible healthcare setting um, the one thing I think we're going to see a wave of into the winter is people presenting for tests when they think they have COVID but they probably just have the flu if the flu comes back and the testing is going to turn up negative, negative, negative for most of those people. But people presenting for tests might go in a certain kind of wave. And you might notice in certain countries that you're actually kind of implicitly tracking the, the flu wave uh, if there is one. So that's you know, one area where it could be applicable. I see uh, Alan de Bromhead and Michael Darcy have questions. So um, Michael, maybe you first, then you, Alan. Okay, uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting. I claim no great skill when it comes to mathematics as was discovered by my teacher in primary school. So um, I admire the work that you're doing greatly. Um, and, and there seems to be a gap though, as an ordinary citizen between the calmness and predictability of your models and what I was listening to in the RTE media debate and the political conversation. But picking, picking up uh, just the point a moment ago, isn't there something really important missing? You keep missing. You keep talking about trading partners, but you're missing our closest trading partner, the other part of the island. There's no I dimension in your formula. Yet, if you think about the conversation around managing the pandemic, and certainly, surely one of the great lessons of this pandemic is that we better manage the next one in a more coherent, coordinated and joined up way on this island, whatever about between these islands. And that's not there. So could I ask you the question? I mean, clearly, I'm very well aware, as Danny and others on this call would know about the difficulties of data and joining up data north and south, etc. But since we're now very much in a new era with the protocol and the post uh, Brexit scenario, what needs to be done so that politicians and policymakers, even businesses in communities that are not happen to be both sides of the border? I mean, there's a stat no one ever mentions, which was given to me, 16% of the urban area of dairies in the Republic. Where is the modeling that takes account, any account of, of these basic realities that have been brought home to us in so many other settings? Even this morning, you heard on Morning in Ireland, the Irish News headline, People from the Republic packing out hotels in Northern Ireland, shock, horror, fear. You know, I do think it's important if I'm, you know, might suggest that this important work you're doing in modeling has a capacity or builds the capacity, because as I know it's not automatically there in most instances, to put in that I factor and to make it meaningful and relevant for decision makers. So what needs to be done? So by I, you mean the island, Michael, yeah? As yeah. an island, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I suppose so that's a question about the high frequency data that's available or can be patched together from both sides of the border, I guess. But over 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 to Donald and Luke. Yeah, so I think uh, I think that question of Northern Ireland, it it sort of goes to what we were what we were trying to do with the exercise. So when we when we started out and it it depends on what you're trying to model. So in this case, um, we had a global pandemic and what we were really focusing on was um you know there's always two sides you can if you're, if you're going for big aggregates uh and trying to take in the global economy you're going to lose a huge amount of detail in in terms of the, the type of model that you select so we wanted something with the logistic model and how we approached it we wanted something simple uh flexible that wasn't going to basically crash the computer when we ran it every single day and and at the expense of that yeah we did miss a lot of the, the detail and, and even in the early stages of the pandemic uh, to get things I think back in uh, April May we did think it would be a nice idea even to break down the US into the different states and to get the state level uh, cases and deaths data on a, on a daily basis was, was just not really available uh, so that's I mean that's really I mean that's kind of a, 
a broad answer as to why the Northern Ireland uh, thing was not in our paper. It's just it was just different models for different types of questions, and for us, this was really a a high level kind of thing. What how do we look as Ireland? compared to Korea, which is doing quite well, and then compared to the UK, and then compared to Germany, and, and how are those countries moving? Uh, so for, for Northern Ireland, I mean, maybe Luke could say something about the, uh, the real-time data, uh, but for, for the COVID uh, stuff, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe the UK is broken down at this stage, but at the time that we were setting this up originally, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't there, I don't think so anyway. Uh, not on a not in a source that was comparative across countries because the ECDC data was was collected for every country and published every day at the time, so it gave us a nice uh, benchmark. As I said, with all of the caveats about how deaths are counted um, over time. So I don't know if Luke, you want to say anything about is uh, the real time data is it split out north and south or, or is that something you've looked into? Uh, not something not something i'm aware of I, the only one i i do know is that the mobility data is available on a, on a county basis so it's not something we looked at in too much detail maybe in the early stages of the pandemic i think we did kind of look at like mobility by county comparing it to, to the whole country and we weren't seeing anything anything interesting enough to kind of proceed and look go any further than, than looking at it initially um and and i think the revolute data has been provided to us on a county basis as well and Again, we didn't see anything significant. We didn't see any significant heterogeneity over there either. So, so um, no, some of the, a lot of the other data say, yeah, the ECDC data. No, we haven't got any, any, uh, any more micro than, than just like looking at country level so far. David, do you want? Yeah, I just wanted to add there about the um, the border. I mean, the, the, the I mentioned that Google Mobility uh, and the blockchain stringency are public measures, but the mobile phone data, I think, is this beautiful private data set that no one has access to, which would show uh, cross border. And, and it would show from this point of view, when the cell towers at the border uh, suddenly pick up an Irish number, that's recorded because they're, you're switching from the sides of the border. And I would expect that in the recent days and weeks, there's been a much greater level of that versus versus normal time. And that would be, you know, if that was to be available somehow on a real time way, that could, you know, uh, give some comfort or warning to, to, to the health ministers on both sides of the border who have to, uh, you know, could deal with this. Um, so that, that's just one thing. It's an interesting point. research paper, even going back to take a look at it, because presumably, it will be available or can be made available through um, through the telco company, something we might actually ask them about um, in time, because you also had what the citizens would believe to be real time information of getting the debt notice and case numbers every night on the public broadcaster. And also simultaneously, sometimes the confusion of hearing what the restrictions released in the north of Ireland were sometimes confuse myself of a morning as to what was about to occur in the next couple of days thinking oh, I didn't think that was happening you know you get confused you know that there is a, a very interesting overlap um, as, a, as a research exercise um, uh, even apart from its practicality. Alan? Thank you. Yeah thanks very much for a very interesting presentation and, and discussion. I'm, I'm just wondering about uh, whether it is possible to look at the stringency and mobility data and see if there's any sort of link across country and perhaps across time to the supports that were made available or the structure of the supports um, in terms of pandemic payments or, or furlough schemes or whatever different schemes were um, rolled out across different countries and to see whether this had any impact on mobility or on um, the sort of the stringency of, of lockdowns that could be applied in certain countries at certain times. Thanks, Al. I might jump in on that one. So um, I suppose the, the one issue when I think of US versus Europe is that Europe's uh, support payments are, are kind of automatic, whereas the US is a little more stimulus checks. So there's actual, actual policy uh, action there as part of it. Um, I mean, the work that the Google Mobility tracks workplace visits, which is one pretty clear way that you go about um, looking into that. Uh, I suppose what you want to do is look at countries which have given high versus low levels of support and see whether that was adhered to or not, i.e. did were the payments enough to stop people going into work. But then you're you're kind of conflicted because you know most people did stay at home anyway because they, they physically were, were legally kind of stopped from doing so. Um, and then 
any time where that has been kind of ignored and thinking of Ireland's recent rise in workplace uh, visits, which is within the level of restrictions, that is not so much related to, to the payments. Uh, it's down to employers asking their staff to come back or even people themselves just feeling that it's safer to do so. So uh, it's a great question. I'd, I'd love to know if there has been uh, an impact. I'm just, uh, I, 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 I'm actually just kind of laying out why I'm not sure how I'd go about answering it. Great, Thank you. thanks, David. Hi, Cheng, do you want to um, come in on anything? Is there any comment you'd like to make about the paper or the methodology? If you want to unmute. Um, yeah, I I think it's uh, it has been a very it has been a very very uh, vivid uh, discussion, and I think um, I've learned a lot, <laughs> apparently. Um, uh, from these discussions, um, uh, I'm actually uh, doing a little bit of further more work on this paper with my students over here. So uh, there are several technical problems that we are uh, we are facing at the moment uh, when we adapt to some thing, some 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 other data. Uh, but now after this today's um, discussion, I think uh, we have put more new ideas um, on. Um, on what to do next. Um, so I think this is what I'm going to do uh, very soon uh, later on. But now uh, I'll probably put myself mute, mute again for the baby. <laughs> anyway, so uh, it has been very helpful and Great. I've learned a lot and I hope you do too. Yeah. Great, thank you. No, I appreciate you coming on very much so. And um, maybe that point might bring start to bring proceedings to a close. Um, Donald, Luke, would you like to say any final final words and summing up? Uh, well, I just uh, no, just thanks for thanks for organising. Uh, it's been a very good uh, discussion. I think the points about uh, estimating with this high frequency data, the, how the relationships between these stringency indexes and, and observed mobility is, is very interesting, and it's something that we we thought maybe we could do is to combine our estimates early on these kind of pandemic steepness curves and, and relate that to. Um, uh, yeah, to these more kind of economic hits. Um, but that's, I mean, the, the volume of data that's come out since we started the project is just incredible. And, and Luke has taken a lot of that forward with the department's real-time indicators. Uh, so there is, there's a lot more available there. Uh, and it, yeah, I can, it'll be a very um, vibrant area, I think, in the future. But no, it's just to thank uh, participants for the discussion, to thank David for a, a careful read of the paper and uh, an interest and insights. Um, and that's, yeah, that's all for me. Thanks, Donald. Luke, do you want to say anything? Yeah, no, just to echo what Donald said. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for, for inviting us to discuss. And yeah, the, the talk about the, looking at the different relationships and how they've changed over time. So that's something we've looked at where the uh, relationship between, say, the economic impact in terms of GDP or MDD in Ireland has changed um, compared against, say, mobility. Um, and, and and look, the, the stringency index just as kind of consumers and firms have kind of changed behaviour over time as kind of consumption and has moved online. So that's something we're kind of looking into a little bit anyway. Um, but yeah, no, so it'd be as someone said, an interesting area for research going forward. So no, thanks, thanks again, thanks for your time. Great, no, appreciate it. Ronan, do you want to make some? concluding remarks for our next session and so on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just add in also um, uh, thanks to, to Maeve and Trist for, for helping organize uh, and run today. And also thanks to our two um, reviewers, the, the peer reviewers who reviewed the paper originally. Um, uh, for their for their um, their help in, in in bringing today about, and then uh, as Danny mentioned, we have our final session uh, coming up in a, in a couple of weeks' time on June seventeenth, also Thursday, um, uh, in three weeks from now, um, and at the same time slot four thirty, uh, we have a, a paper by Donna Lawler and Jean Atchison from the Revenue Commissioners, uh, a review of fifteen years of corporate tax returns. So, uh, what I'll be doing is I'll be sending out an email next week. Um, with information on, on the how to register for that. Um, and hopefully we'll see many of you uh, at that and feel free to spread the word as well as it'll be online. So uh, all who can attend, even uh, if they're in China and it's uh, one o'clock in the morning, uh, anyone can come along and watch that. So thanks to everyone for coming along. Okay, thanks everybody. So um, well done again and uh, have a good evening and good night to you. And thanks Shane, hope baby wasn't awoken by our interruption. Okay, bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.